This episode contains some fruity language that I bleeped out. Comedy. Can people laugh about the climate and ecological crisis? What is the role of comedy in educating people about sustainable transport and renewable energy? In this episode of Tipping Points, we'll hear from a comic actor and YouTuber who seems to be moving ever closer to sitting in the road. I have with me Robert Llewellyn, the host of Fully Charged, which is a YouTube channel and a website focusing on electric vehicles and renewable energy, and the actor who plays Crichton in Red Dwarf, which is a, a fantastic comedy show that I grew up with. Uh, so a comedy icon and a pioneer of transition away from fossil fuels. Welcome. What really drew me in to invite you to this interview was a, a comment that you made during a, a talk when you were at COP26 in Glasgow. And this was uh, when you were talking about not just electric vehicles, but other kind of solutions. And you mentioned that the real solution here isn't just to simply convert car drivers to champion electric vehicles, but to reduce individual car use. So, yeah. I mean, this showed me that you have been on a journey and I'd very much like to hear more about it. Starting with a, a bit of background, have you always been interested in tech and science or has this been a kind of a growing interest for you? I've used the excuse that my failure at uh, 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 mathematics my inability with mathematics is what stopped me from going into serious engineering because I was fascinated by that so as a kid I spent thousands of hours with an with a second-hand Meccano set and for I mean if you for your listeners who don't know what that is who are younger so it's a kind of a an engineering constructor set so you could build things like cranes and diggers and cars and suspension systems but it had gears and axles and you could make I made a three-speed gearbox I was fascinated with all that and I was doing that as a as you know 11 12 13 year old so my relationship with cars was always really conflicting because I was a keen cyclist and I like I loved riding bikes it made sense you know I couldn't afford a car anyway so uh, when I was young so I always rode bikes I became a bit of a radical cyclist and I learned to drive a, a go-kart when I was probably 10 years old my brother and, uh, and I put it together it was a lawnmower engine on the back of a an old go-kart and it, it was crude as and dangerous now I think back <laughs> There was a whole period of time uh, where I would not go in a car. I made a deliberate decision that cars were fascist. They were part of the oppression of the of the masses. And they were, you know, I hated them. And I would only go on trains or buses or my bike for, you know, quite a few years as a sort of annoying hippie, which I was. I stayed in a commune, a proper hippie commune in the Welsh mountains in the early 70s when I was very young. And there were two post-grad engineering students from Oxford University, so like proper clever, uh, who built a crude wind generator on the, uh, out the, on the hill outside the back of this house. That, because there's no, there was no mains, it wasn't connected to the mains, the house. It was, you know, it had never had electricity in its history. They used an old, uh, an alternator, I think, out of an old truck uh, from a scrapyard. And it was all really, it was very scrappy challenge. It was very much like that. And because I was, young and didn't understand fear they they'd send me up this rickety wooden tower to do maintenance on it which was really dangerous because you couldn't stop it it didn't have you know one, if it was turning if the wind was blowing it was turning it was turning and if it hit you on the head it would have taken your head off that power went into a load of old truck batteries on the floor of the kitchen where there were toddlers and children crawling it's so dangerous it's ridiculous but it did mean that we had a crude form of electric lighting in this house which was not there before the terms like renewable energy, sustainable technology, they didn't even exist then. There was, there was a movement around that time in the mid to late 70s of alternative societies and alternative technologies that would be low impact technologies. So a lot of the bicycle technology around cargo bikes, uh, electrifying bikes started in its very crude terms around that time. You know, the fluke of me ending up in a as an actor in a TV comedy series was really not a planned thing it just happened uh, I never wanted to be on the telly or be an actor you know for, and I can say that in all honesty it was I had no interest in it what I really pursued with enthusiasm and vigor was scrap heap challenge 
Scrap Heap really was the thing that I wanted to do. So you could be silly and show off, but you were also actually talking about stuff that mattered, how you make stuff, how stuff is built, what it's made of, who learns to make that, where does that skill come from? All that stuff was, you know, really, I didn't have to fake an interest in Scrap Heap. So that's how I ended up kind of doing what I'm doing now, I guess. The interesting thing with Scrap Heap Challenge is that, as you say, it's a skill of repair, it's a skill of reusing, it's a skill of making things. Yeah. Now, We've seen a, a massive fall in, in manufacturing in the UK, but also the value of repairing things when they break, right? So w- when we yeah. get a laptop that breaks, we, we get a new one because how on earth could you repair it? Yeah. So um, do you think that that's a skill that we should be able to, to get more in touch with as we go in, into the future decades? When I was a kid, we made stuff in this country. It was a huge manufacturing base, you know, a, and that has really changed in my lifetime, particularly in the last 40 years. That's been offshored. And it is mainly Southeast Asia, China in particular. That's where stuff is made now. And that, why is China building so many uh, coal-fired power stations, but also putting in huge amounts of renewables? Is because they make everything that we have. You know? What I think is happening now is everyone in the world is going, oh, wait a minute. Well, everything's made in China. <laughs> oh, do you think that's dangerous? <laughs> You know, do you think that might possibly become a problem at some point in the future? Let's start making things in England. I mean, one of the examples we're following is British Vault, which would be one of the biggest factories built in this country in probably 50 years, uh, which is being built up in uh, in uh, Northumberland, making batteries, you know, because we need to we need that. That's the technology we need. I'm really glad there's enough intelligent people around to go. Let's not build another oil refinery. <laughs> so let's build some batteries. The location of British Vault is next to a huge power line coming in from Norway where all the electricity is renewable. That's the whole point of it. There's no point making batteries from burning in coal to make them, you know. So I do think we will see an increase in manufacturing here. It will never be enough, but I think it will happen. I think it will happen around the world. One of the benefits of Scrap It that I never imagined before we started doing it was that there was a huge increase in people entering engineering at university. <laughs> Uh, as a result of it. And I mean, that, that was from people who ran engineering departments at universities. So they, they were struggling like hell to get any students interested in engineering before Scrap Heap was on. And afterwards, they were struggling because there were so many people applying to do engineering at university. Yeah. And how, how much of a reliance do you think that we should have on technology when fossil fuel companies promote the next tech, that it is a way for them to delay and and distract from the more profound and more difficult decisions that we all need to make, which is to reduce our consumption. Yeah. So um, how how much do you think that um, technology really plays in dealing with climate and ecological emergency? I mean, I think there are aspects of it that that genuinely could and and indeed might. Just for, for an example, the ease of access to car sharing. Let's, let's go back 20 years. And there's a that time there was car rental. You could go to Avis and rent a car. It was quite complicated. You had to fill in a difficult form. You had to pay for it with your credit card. You, you knew you were going to get stung on the insurance. You knew it was going to be bad. That was a complicated, grant, you know, gritty. There was a lot of grit in the gears to do that. It, I've just seen, and we're doing a show about it very soon, uh, a scheme in Utrecht in the Netherlands, just electric cars, that all the people that use it say, oh, this is better this is a better experience than owning a car. It's hugely cheaper, and not only because of the fuel, but because of the necessity to look after that car for the 90% of the time you own it when you don't use it, which is... Always parked on driveways, right? Yeah, exactly. And that, that is my argument, is that it's an un- it doesn't matter what powers the car. At the end of the day, no, it's still better to have an electric car, but what, 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 it doesn't matter what powers the car. It's a ridiculous, unsustainable habit that we've got into of owning cars so there technology actually helps to make that transition which a lot of people are going to find either impossible or very painful they're not going to want to do it and and when you do need a car it's really cool if you're in a car sharing scheme that has uh, 60 tesla model threes and f- and 500 ionic five yeah i think and, that and, car and, sharing and is a hundred really like six seven hundred renault zoe's you know too. you can and they're uh, all over I the city what you and they've all got a parking Prince space might- because they have res- regulated public spaces with a charge in what we eat. If you buy uh, trimmed beans from Kenya, 
I think you've got to sort of think, well, hang on, they were flown here in an aeroplane. You know, this is really talk about unsustainable. And now you get them in a plastic box that you use. I mean, single use plastic has that whole notion will be looked back on historically as, oh, they actually were insane. Yeah, with single use plastics, I think it's one of those things that is in the common consciousness of people, but only because it's the one thing that they have to deal with. Yeah. The kinds of things that are um, um, worse for the environment, much worse, are hidden. For example, yeah. like the land use and the water use of uh, yeah. livestock. That kind of brings me on to another question. Like how, how much of the solutions should actually rely on individual action rather than legislation? So we know that the carbon footprint came from BP in 2015, the personal carbon footprint, in a way to blame the consumer for making bad choices. But should we be given uh, the choice in supermarkets? You know, when, when the true impacts require extensive knowledge of supply chains and effect on ecology and so on. hugely complex, yeah. Right. I mean, I'd like my food buying experiences to be guilt-free. If I go into a shop to buy some food, I don't want to analyze the ingredients yes. or where they've come from. <laughs> but yeah. if I were to say, okay, that uh, that's the, the supermarket I want, and the only way to do that is to have incredible legislation to ban effectively all of these products, then that's a really hard sell. So should the solutions rely on individual action or should it rely on legislation? You know, smoking, because I was a smoker and I gave up in the late 80s, I think. And it was becoming more and more socially unacceptable. And loads of people still smoke then. And you could still smoke indoors, you could smoke in restaurants, you could smoke on planes. (laughs) You know, that has now become so socially unacceptable the public perception has shifted to such a remarkable degree and i'm hoping that it's now generally accepted i think that if you're a parent who's driven to your child's school to pick them up in your suv and you're sitting outside on the street with your engine running that is now viewed as just generally by society as a bad thing you know and people will come up to you and ask you to turn your engine off So there's a general consciousness common amongst people that that is not good to leave that engine running. Well, that is a clue to how we change behaviours. So can the same thing then happen with plastic packaging, import food that's flown in from countries overseas, meat, eating dairy products? So there's far more people on a vegetarian diet now than there was when I was born, for instance. When I was born, there were a few mad eccentrics in the hills around Cheltenham. <laughs> I mean, huge amounts of people are vegetarian now. Even if they're like me, lazy vegetarians. I mean, I sometimes eat fish. I do eat dairy products. I just don't eat meat. I do have an understanding, having grown up in a farming community and worked on farms, I absolutely know that the fact that I don't eat meat is fairly token because I'm st- if I eat cheese, I'm effectively supporting the meat industry, you know, because you can't have cheese without killing a couple of cows. You know, you've got to murder some babies to in order in order and keep the, and keep the cow producing milk to be able to get the milk. You know? Yeah, that's right. I understand that your daughter is vegan. Is that right? Yeah, she is. Yes, yes. Have you had kind of difficult conversations with her about that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, she's critical of me in many ways, and she's right to be. You know, for my political incorrectness, my you know terminology, my attitudes to can't list them too many. I lived in a a squat in London in the mid to late 70s with four very hardcore, hardline, active feminists. The political turmoil that I grew up in was about feminism, was about Northern Ireland, was about sexism and homophobia. You know, those topics were very at the forefront of of daily discussion. And, I, you know, I definitely tried to live differently than my father. But eventually, I ended up owning a house, having a mortgage, owning a car, having two kids, having a job. I wonder then how children actually have carved the path of people of your generation in whether the growing awareness of the climate and ecological emergency has been a response to your your children's generation talking to parents. Yeah, absolutely enormous. I mean, we've got a a wonderful example of that, of a company we've interviewed a couple of times who ran one of the biggest Porsche dealerships in the country. They they were wealthy. They were making a lot of money selling high-end, expensive German sports cars. And their daughter, when she was 12 or 13, I know she was a young, young girl, she'd read something, seen something, and she just came back one day and said, Mom, Dad, you can't do this anymore. 
it's just wrong. You're selling these cars and they're awful. And the dad was devastated. You know, and he clearly adores his daughter. And they went in the next day, they told their employees, they're getting rid of, the, they're give, giving the business away. They are stopping 100%. They're not going to sell combustion engine cars anymore. That's it. They now run one of the biggest electric vehicle rental systems called Electric Zoo. Amazing story. It's on fully charged. That is a child turning, you know, and not, and not just going, Dad, I don't think we should eat meat <laughs> in your own kitchen. That's like their whole business, their whole livelihood was dependent on that. And they chucked it all away and started again. That really gives hope to to the younger listeners listening to this who whose parents uh, might be running companies that, that are doing things that could change. And you know, it empowers those people perhaps to think maybe they can make a massive change by just having good, frank conversations with their parents. Yeah. You know, if your dad works for, your mom works for Shell and they pay the mortgage and you're going, you can't work for Shell anymore. <laughs> It's a disgrace. I mean, it must be awful because those conversations I know will have happened. You know, you just know they will. Or you work for BP and you know, I think those discussions are going on. The general swing of history, I think, is moving towards the end of the fossil fuel era. You know, I think that's happening. And the fossil fuel industry know, know it is, and they're just fighting tooth and nail to delay that as long as possible. But they know it is. They know it is. to come in a second but i'd like to say at this point that i'll be recording interviews on the topics the police the media education and air travel from the start of february so if you have any questions about the role of these topics in addressing the climate and ecological crisis or to give feedback on the podcast please email tipping points all one word at imperial.ac.uk you can find the privacy policy at the imperial college grantham institute website now moving on to changing behavior through comedy that's one of the, the the big drivers that really gets people on board is if you yeah. make them laugh, they'll they'll be much more willing to listen to what you've got yes. to say. So um, what uh, what is the role of comedy moving forward? It's really I because this is an area I've had considerable experience in specifically using comedy to try and communicate about kind of social change and, and attitudinal change. And I'm not 100 percent optimistic about it. <laughs> So in the, for a, a chunk of the 1980s, sort of late 70s to early 80s, I was, I was in a, a comedy theatre group that became phenomenally popular. We were very successful, that were primarily about the male response to feminism, the male attitudes to sexism, to homophobia. But in the long term, you know, when, they, when you think there are now documentaries about rape culture in the UK... That makes me think that all that time and effort we spent trying to do stuff about a positive response to equality, to not being sexist, was a total waste of time. And so that is heart, kind of heartbreaking. Those stories are always blown out of proportion by the press, and that's just the way that, that, that the press operates. But I think that exists. Well, this is interesting, right? Because this uh, conversation about why racism exists... When you know the people, you don't have these crazy views, but it's only when you have this kind of fear of the other. We can see in the press at the moment the discussions about immigration uh, with, with people crossing the channel. And rather than the conversation being about let's embrace humans that happen to be from somewhere else because they're in a war-torn, terrible situation, the conversation it hasn't matured like that. But I wonder if, if, if comedy can help the conversation move forward. I mean, I think it can. I think it can. And I mean, I think it certainly in terms of racism, I think the fact that there are Nish Kumar, Phil Wang, you know, the fact that those people have become quite uh, successful as comedians. But I mean, I think you're right that, that you can counter that. And I think it probably does help. Uh, a great comedian years ago who was on The Fast Show and he did a sort of, he was a right on Northern comedian. I can't remember what the character was, but he did say, you know, an Arab, a Jew, an African walk into a bar. What a wonderful example of racial integration. <laughs> <laughs> that was his opening line. You know? <laughs> so uh, how about, uh, how about conversations with the boys from the dwarf then? Um, if you would have a conversation in a pub with them about climate change, for example, how would it go down? Oh my God. I've never even tried. I mean, they would, take the piss to start with certainly craig would 
and and would immediately point out the massive levels of hypocrisy that I've quite happily flown around the world for work for decades. You know, my my carbon footprint from flying is off the scale. I don't I don't think think we've ever discussed that. I would love to. Now you've said it, I'm going to try. <laughs> next time we're all together <laughs> it's hypocrisy that is a really big barrier for a lot of people because everybody yeah has got a huge carbon footprint in the uk yeah right? well and in, in, uh, we, well, we are yes if you live in a village in africa less so right and and to, to talk about owning up to our carbon footprints even though i don't particularly like using the term but i think it's it's valuable in this case it's something that i think when we own up to and say hey i've done all this the, these carbon intensive things and I'm going to stop doing them that yeah. sends a really powerful message but I wonder having conversations with with friends and colleagues has made it into your world yet oh yeah definitely I mean I'm, I'm, we talk about it a lot I mean certainly in terms of fully charged we would put I mean, maybe one or two episodes out ever that have the word climate in the title and they are they get the least views of any show we've ever put out I'm slightly baffled by it because I sort of think, oh, well, it's our audience. They're kind of aware of it. So the audience that would bother to watch Fully Charged have probably internally, even if not vocally, acknowledged that there is such a thing as climate change, that it does exist and that human activity is the cause of it. So then they see something about climate. Oh, God, I don't know about that. I can't. So they don't watch it. And actually, interestingly, the one episode we put out recently, which is during COP, which had the word climate in the title, it's getting more views now. It's kind of building it's but initially it was the lowest views we've ever had like in the first 24 hours that's when you sort of judge if something's hit or not that's interesting and i yeah i wonder if that's an audience reaction to something that they just don't want to engage with but out of fear and out of um... it might be out of fear but it might also be out of exhaustion from hectoring Mm -hmm. you know the reaction of my generation to the likes of greta thunberg is oh god i don't want to be told by bloody noel 16 17 year old about how bad i am and you go well you know i know you don't but she's right <laughs> she might be annoying but she's right the fact that she's upset jeremy clarkson has raised her in my estimation by a thousand degrees. he's had a hor- you know he's had a horrible snip at her and his demented bigoted old git that he is how how would uh, how would crichton explain climate change to lister <laughs> Well, it would be it would be historic, wouldn't it? But that's the thing by then. So that's three million years in the future is when Red Dwarf is happening. And Lister would have been appalled. I think that would be the you know, Crichton would just explain it in purely, you know, unemotional factual terms, is that human activity caused the the climate on the earth to change, and it was a real problem for humanity until we stopped doing it, and then it got it, it, it stabilized, and we survived another million years before you know the the big meteorite hit. And wiped to you know, but I mean, I think it would be in those terms. It wouldn't be an emotive issue for Crichton, but it would be for Lister. Lister would be, you know, because he like he's aware, like human beings are scum, man. Really, basically, at the end of the day, you know, it's gonna be all that stuff. Moving on to protest and an extinction rebellion. So, I, I'd like to know what you think about the actions of XR and, and Insulate Britain as well in responding to the emergency of the situation. Yeah. Probably conflicted, but essentially supportive. My toes curl with the awfulness of the press response. So I'm using the word press very consciously, not the media, because I don't think there is a the media, but I think there is still the press, which is the, the newspapers, which basically not many people under my age buy. I don't buy newspapers. I haven't bought a newspaper in 20 years, but pe- I have to acknowledge some people still do. And the people that write them, particularly the Daily Mail being that, you know, that's the biggest selling thing, have an, have a voice and an influence on British society. So their reaction to things like Extinction Rebellion and Insulate Britain will be 100% negative and utterly wrong as well, completely the wrong end of every stick. Yes, yeah, so in terms of generalised sympathy for the Daily Mail, zero, for Extinction Rebellion, quite high. But the one thing that when they had the demonstration in Oxford Circus, was that 2019? And then Emma Thompson flew in from Los Angeles and went there to support them. You know, so she, from her absolute individual point of view, she feels passionately about that and she wanted to support them and she knew that she would be able to get publicity because of who she is to support them. It backfired horribly. You know, she just flown around the world, you know, and I don't think she flies economy. I'm just going to say that. It's so easy to immediately demolish those arguments because of that 
you know the rampant scale of self worth and, and hypocrisy on the on the part of celebrities. And I've talked to people in the Green Party who wanted me to be a kind of public figure in support of the Green Party, and I just you don't you don't want a celebrity anywhere near you. you just avoid them like the plague. You know, I'm an absolute worst yeah, yeah. person that could be involved in. Uh, an environmental political party because of the work I've done has all been a huge amount of it has involved travel. I've filmed overseas an enormous amount. This goes back to the part about hypocrisy being at the hurdle. When I remember speaking to my uncle about how sad and depressed I was about climate change. But then uh, he said, well, you know, you've flown to 60 countries, haven't you? I just thought I was sod off because it's not about that. I feel that shame of having done those things, but I did it without being aware of the problems. But now I am. It would be hypocritical for me to go and do all these things. Yes, yes. That, I, think that's a, I think that's very true. I agree with you. And, it is, and it's also the absolute joy that the reactionary extreme right, who will absolutely dance on the fact that some trendy lefty that they would accuse me of being is is a hypocrite. And I think it's really important to to shrug that off. I think you're right to do that, to go, yeah, so what? Because you are a massively, you don't even care. You just shit on people and laugh in their face. You're the bastard still. I'm a twat, <laughs> but you are a vicious, vicious, nasty human being, you dirty little shitter. I think, and I wouldn't say that to them, but that would be the subtext. Sorry, it's a bit of a rude torrent there. <laughs> that even if I am a hypocrite, my hypocrisy is gentler. It's full of more love. It's full of more empathy and understanding of other people's situations around the world. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 where the the press and social media have been responsible for a lot of this division, uh, capitalising on emotional outrage rather than providing opportunities for the discussion. I can see how greed in this case has created forges in society. In a sense that, as we were talking about before, when you had the, those interactions with uh, the people you were living with in, in that commune, when you were having conversations with people who think totally differently to you, it opens your eyes and you think, wow, actually, they're not crazy for thinking something totally different. And I wonder if, if, if there's uh, an attempt that we can make here well, in comedy, but also in, in uh, local politics, in bringing together groups who are very different. People, how, how could a local council bring together someone who lives in, in their own house with someone who lives in a council flat? How can those conversations happen? When we gather for the harvest supper, for the, uh, what's it, the safari supper, for various events in the village, I live in the Cotswolds, the village quiz, that is an amazing combination of people in one space from proper old school rural working class to a, a, a guy who's just flown in in the, in the company helicopter, you know, extraordinarily wealthy. And they're all together and they all get on, but on a really small level. And I think that there is an element of that. And I don't think this is a solution, but I think there is an element where small communities just by the nature of human beings, can function in a more healthy way because it's not overwhelming. I mean, I feel bad now sort of going off on a sort of spleen-venting rant about, you know, extremist right-wing bigots because eventually, you know, what needs to happen is I need to sit down with a heavily tattooed man wearing a pair of shorts with a Union Jack on them to try and find common ground. I mean, that is true, and he'll hate my guts and I'll hate his, but in a way we've got to try and we have to live together. I don't want to live in a bubble. You know, that's, I've struggled all my life not to live in a bubble, which is, in a way, would be my critique, if you like, of Extinction Rebellion and, and Insulate Britain, because, it's, you know, I want to support them, and I think they're right. I think I absolutely support what they're doing, and I think they should stop the traffic, and I think they should annoy people, and it should be, you know, a bloke who wants to get to work and he can't get to work. Well, just think for a moment why they tried to stop you getting to work. How are you getting to work? You're getting to work in a metal box that weighs one and a half tonnes and burns fossil fuel. Just think about that for a moment and carry on now, because now you can drive into work. They're not doing it today, but just plant that seed. And they've planted that seed. And there's going to be loads of people who will never respond positively to that. But there's going to be some that go, well, oh, you know, they got a point. <laughs> 
What would it take for you to sit in the road and get arrested for protest? I mean, you know, in some ways I feel I should do it now. You know, there's no, you know, I do feel very strongly that, that you know, the world needs to stop burning fossil fuel. I, I've kind of stopped doing demos and I don't really know why. It could be that I'm basically a closet Tory. I don't think it is. I now find the Tory party so repugnant, uh, what it's become. You know, there's been periods in my life where I've tried to be benign about people who have slightly different views to me, but pretty Patel, it's very hard to love her. <laughs> I've noticed that a, a, a really common theme among uh, uh, throughout our whole discussion has been about the flow of conversation. It's about the conversation between your, your children and you, between you and your neighbours, between, between politicians. Like the flow of conversation seems to have featured in a lot of our points. And that's really encouraging. And I hope that the conversations that uh, you have, even with um, you know, the Red, the Red Dwarf yes. crew, we, we might even look forward to an, an, the next episode of Red Dwarf that confronts climate change. I think, it, I think you're absolutely right. It, it, and it is listening as well is equally important and I'm a terrible talker but I have in my latter years learned to listen and that's very much down to my the intervention of my, my wife who's an amazing woman who tells me every now and then to shut up <laughs> and with that well that was a fascinating talk and uh, th thank you very much Robert the Wellen for a, a wonderful conversation well thank you for having me thank you Music from Climate by Eric Ian Walker. Commissioned by the Climate Music Project, we communicate the sense of urgency of the climate and ecological crises through the emotional power of music. More to be found at ericianwalker.bandcamp.com and climatemusic.org.